Turning to 1 Kings chapter 18, uh, of course it is to do with that day that Elijah prayed for God to send the fire on Mount Carmel, and this is the next mountain that we come to in the Bible, and we are going to learn some uh, lessons from the Word of God that are of course applicable to our day, and we trust that as we preach the gospel tonight, the Lord will challenge hearts. We're reading from 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse number 16. 
So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and that thou hast followed Balaam. Now therefore send, and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal four hundred and fifty, and the prophets of the groves four hundred, which eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel, and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, Not a word. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks. Let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on wood and put no fire under. And I will dress the other bullock and lay it on wood and put no fire under. And ye call ye on the name of your gods. And I will call in the name of the Lord and the God that answereth by fire. Let him be God. And the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank thee for the reading of this passage. Lord, it's a familiar passage to many in this gathering, but we pray that that familiarity will not uh, put us off from listening and from applying our hearts and our minds to what is being said tonight. We pray, O oh Lord, that we will receive this truth with freshness tonight and that there will be teaching for the souls of each individual gathered here. We pray, Lord, you'll save the lost. Pray, O oh Lord, that you'll speak to the backslider. Pray, O oh Lord, you'll bless thy children who are walking with thee. Encourage them in these days. Maybe they feel like Elijah did. They're the only one, maybe, in their workplace, in their home, or in their area. Maybe they feel like that. Lord, we know that that wasn't the case, even in Elijah's way, but we pray for those, perhaps, who are just feeling the heat of the battle today. Lord, that will encourage them and equip them for the week that lies ahead in thy will, that they may be used of God and have that peace that passeth all understanding. Empty me of self and sin and fill me with thy spirit and give me help in the preaching of thy word. For it's in Jesus' name I ask these things for the glory of the Lord. Amen. Amen. I'm sure you've come up this mountain many times before, from Sunday school days right through to various gospel meetings where this word has been preached. And yet as we stand upon this mountain again tonight, my prayer is that we will learn and hear something that will be of great encouragement to our souls, those of us who are saved. And of course, that if you're not saved, that tonight you will be challenged in your heart. You'll be challenged where you stand before God and about the importance of making sure that you stand right before God. As this passage opens, we find that Ahab goes to meet Elijah. Elijah is the prophet in Israel. Ahab is the king of Israel. And in his opening statement to Elijah, he says in verse number 17, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And the first lesson that we want to glean tonight is this, the assumption of the ungodly that the believer is a problem in the land. The assumption of the ungodly that it is the believer who is the problem in the land. Do you see the misconception of the unsaved? This wicked man says to God's man, art thou he that troubleth Israel? There are many people today in Northern Ireland, indeed throughout this world, who genuinely believe that the problems of this world and the problems in their lives are caused by Christians or religious people or by churches. 
There are those today who feel if there was no Bible, no gospel, uh, no church, no Christians, then everybody could just get on with their lives and do whatever they wanted to do and they wouldn't be bothered with religion. And this comes to the fore especially whenever Christians hold biblical convictions, biblical standpoints, biblical standards. They're said to be troubling people. What you say makes me feel bad about myself. That's the argument that many use today in response to closing down the gospel. In fact, in that consultation that's being done at City Hall, part of the reason they're bringing this in is to silence hate preaching in the streets. Now that, of course, is from the point of view of an unsaved person because if the Bible is being preached as it is written, that's certainly not hate preaching. That is the love of God being heralded across our streets. But of course, what's the argument? You're offending people. What you say is offending people, you're hassling them, you're causing them to feel bad about themselves. So the general thought would be, Christians either need to be quiet or go away or just do both. In Philippi, even in Paul's day, the greatest of preachers, there was an accusation made against the Christians. They exceedingly trouble this city. What a misunderstanding of the word trouble. Let me tell you, the preaching of the gospel doesn't bring any trouble to a city. What did Ahab mean when he said that Elijah had troubled Israel? Well, remember, Elijah was God's spokesperson. And there was a famine in the land of Israel. Why was that famine there? Well, turn with me back to chapter 16. And in chapter 16, we read of the commencement of Ahab's reign. Chapter 16, verse 29. And in the thirty and eighth year of Asa, king of Judah, began Ahab, the son of Omri, to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel and Samaria twenty and two years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove. And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Here was an evil man. He was the worst up to this point. More so than all the kings before, he grieved and angered the heart of God. Now being in Israel and having the background of the Old Testament scriptures as they had up to that point, it would have been known that the consequences of the sin of idolatry, of turning against God, of immorality, of all of those things, they were detailed clearly in Scripture. Let me read you an example in Deuteronomy 28. These are consequences, some of the consequences of sin. And thy heaven that is over thy head shall be brass, and the earth that is under thee shall be iron, and the Lord shall make the rain of thy land powder and dust. From heaven it shall come down upon thee until thou be destroyed. That is speaking about drought. And God was going to withhold the the rain. And God was going to cause the land to be parched. And that's exactly what happened. God sent his servant Elisha. Or sorry, Elijah. And if you look at chapter 17, verse 1. Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, Before whom I stand, 
There shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Now you've heard the expression, don't shoot the messenger. Elijah was a messenger. And Ahab took that personally. And Ahab blamed Elijah personally for the trouble that the land was in. But why was the land in trouble? Why was there a drought in the land? Let me tell you, it was because of the sin of Ahab. It was because of his sin. And when we look at the state of our land today, it is because of sin. It is because people have turned away from reading the word of God. They have turned their ears away from the preaching of the word of God. They've tried to take the word of God out of schools. And as a result of that, people are living according to what they believe is right, according to what the government believes is right, rather than what God says is right. And yet they have the audacity to say, Christians are a problem in this land. You listen to the radio, you watch the TV, you read the newspapers. That's what they say. Why are Christians held forth to be the problem? Because they believe and speak forth the word of God, just like Elijah did. And I tell you, if you hold to the word of God, you will be uh, out of the ordinary, really, in this day. The world will not thank you for preaching. Most people will not thank you for your biblical viewpoint. Only those who hate the word and trust in Christ will thank you for preaching the truth. You see, the reality is this. People feel uncomfortable in their sin when they're confronted by truth and light. They love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Ahab had no love for the Lord. Ahab had no love for the people of God. In fact, years later, in 1 Kings 22, someone asked, is there a prophet of the Lord that we might inquire of him? You know what Ahab said? There is yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Imlah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord. But I hate him. I hate him, for he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And is that not the attitude of many ungodly people today? I hate the preaching of the gospel minister because they don't preach good things about me. They don't tell me how good I am. They don't make me feel good about myself. They tell me things that make me feel guilty or make me feel unclean or make me feel uneasy. I hate the preaching of the word of God. Is there someone in the meeting tonight and you hate the preaching of the word of God? Or the preachers of the word of God? Someone watching online and you hate the preaching of the word of God? That's what... This man said, Ahab was so wicked. There is one man who's a prophet of the Lord, but I hate him because he doesn't prophesy good concerning me. Look at the measured response of Elijah. He says in verse number 18, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and has followed Balaam. Thou and thy father's house. You know what Elijah essentially says? Look, it's not my fault. Take a look in the mirror. It's you, Ahab. It's your family. The problem with the land is not the people telling the truth. It's the people living in sin. You see, the law has been forsaken. It's not that there wasn't a law. It's not that the law wasn't available. It's not that there weren't prophets to teach the law. But he forsook the law and went his own way. And what is sin? It is the breaking of God's law. It is the forsaking of God's law. And not only had he broken the law of God, his worship was now turned to a false God. Only the Lord, Jehovah, is worthy of our worship. Only the Lord, God of Israel, is worthy of the praise of man, yet we find all their false gods have been set up in the place of the one true God. And it talks there, but he set up a grove, and that was on top of the mountain, on top of the hills, so that people could see the statue of Balaam. 
He built a house of worship for him. Oh, this was all out idolatry. But Ahab was going to learn you cannot go against God and prosper. You can't go against God and prosper. You might be in the majority in that you hate the preaching of the word of God. You might be in the majority in that you feel that Christians are a problem in this land. But let me tell you, you can't go against God and prosper. Ahab, why do you think that's the way to blessing? Why do you think by turning away from God's word, by going to worship idols, that that's the way of blessing. Yet many people live that way. Let me live my life the way I want to and things will work out okay. Can I say tonight, if you're not saved, do you realize that the way of man naturally ends in hell? You're on your way to hell unless God steps in. You're on your way to hell unless you call upon him for mercy and for cleansing in his precious blood. Sinner, do you not realize the problems of your life are not because of those who are around you? It's because of your sin, your sinful heart, your breaking of the law. The only way to true blessing in this life is not getting your own way, it's going God's way. That's the only way of blessing in time, in death, and in eternity. I would also mention this. Do you not see the blindness of Ahab? The utter spiritual blindness of this man when considering the realities of life. He felt Elijah had the power to trouble Israel or to allow them to be at peace. Who had the power to trouble Israel or allow them to be at peace? It was God. It was God. And today, whenever people stand against the true church, the Christian church, the gospel preaching church, or they stand against the born again believer, they think they're standing against an individual or a group of people. But the reality is they're standing against God. A.W. Pink wrote these words in the last century. How few, how very few acknowledge the hand of God in the present conflicts of the nations. Let it be affirmed that the Lord is dealing with us in judgment for our sins. And even the majority of professing Christians are angered by such a declaration. But read through the scriptures and observe how frequently it is said that the Lord stirred up a certain king to do this or moved him to do that or withheld him from doing the other. And the evidence of the sovereignty of God is seen in the fact that whenever Elijah said to send the people to Mount Carmel. In verse 20, we read these words. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together onto Mount Carmel. This is the sovereignty of God because here's a man who hated Elijah. Why did he listen to what he said? Why did he obey what he commanded? All we can say is that the, the Lord moved him to do it. You see, God's in control. The second lesson we learn, having now come up upon the mountain, is this. There's a challenge that we all must face. You cannot sit on the fence when it comes to spiritual matters. Look at verse 21. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then followed him follow him and the people answered him not a word there were two opinions two opinions the Lord is God or someone else is God the first the Lord is God that's the revelation of scripture it's the confidence of the saints. It's the foundation for each born again believer. The Lord is God and I will obey him. That's what God's people declare tonight. He is God and I follow him. But the second opinion is someone else is God. Now in this instance, it was Baal. If Baal is God, then follow him. But there were other gods in the Bible, all their false gods, I should say, in the Bible. There was uh, Ashtaroth. There was Diana of the Ephesians. 
And therefore, there was always one to challenge the place of God throughout the ages. Today, some have given Mary the place of God and exalted her above Christ. Others bow before Muhammad, while some, like the Hindus, have a multitude of gods. Now, of course, there are many other idols that people live before. They worship money. Some people worship power. That's all they live for, to get as much power as they can. Some worship fame. Some worship science. Some worship self. But the question that we must ask is this. Is the Lord truly God? Or is something else worthy of our worship? Is someone else or something else going to be able to satisfy us in life and keep us safe in the judgment? Is it the Lord or is it something else? You see, there's one decision to be made, and that is to follow that which is true. You see, tonight you're either following the Lord or you're following something else. You're either following the Lord who is leading you to glory or you're following something else that's leading you to hell. Now, Elijah had no doubt that the Lord was God, but he had to put the challenge in front of the people in this way. The words, uh, how long halt ye between two opinions? The word halt, it means to totter. To be over here one moment and to be over here the next moment. Not standing firm on one side or the other. And perhaps there were people and they wanted to try and please God. So they were trying to be religious, but then they wanted to try and please the king. So they engaged in the worship of Balaam. And basically what Elijah is saying, you can't have a foot in both camps. If the Lord is God, follow him. If it's Baal, follow him. But make a decision. A decision had to be made and you're going to make a decision tonight. Dear sinner, you're going to make a decision tonight. Oh, I didn't come to church to make a decision tonight. I didn't watch online to make a decision. But the reality is you're going to make a decision tonight. You're going to decide that the Lord is God and you're going to follow him. Or you're going to decide that someone else or something else is worthy of your soul. You're either going to decide that you want to go to heaven following Christ. Or you want to go to hell following something else. Look at this very solemn challenge in the first words. How long halt ye? How long are you going to think about this? C.H. Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher, preached these words in May 1857. How many of you have been churchgoers and chapelgoers for years? You've been impressed too many a time, but you've wiped the tears from your eyes and said, I will seek God and turn to him with full purpose of heart sometime. And you're now just exactly where you were. How many sermons do you want? How many more Sundays must roll away wasted? How many warnings? How many sicknesses? How many toilings of the bell to warn you that you must die? How many graves must be dug for your family before you will be impressed? How many plagues and pestilences must ravage this city before you will turn to God in truth? We challenge you. How long are you going to wait? You have a measure of interest in the gospel. We know that. You're here tonight or you're watching online. You have some respect when you come into church, the church building. You've never denied that there's a God. You've never asked God to leave you alone and yet you're not saved. You've been ill and you've asked people to pray to God that you would be healed and you're sitting in health tonight. And yet you're not saved. You stood around an open grave within the past week. Maybe within the past month. You've seen the coffin being lowered and you know that you're now moved one step up the line. And yet you're not saved. Let me ask you another question. 
Not how long halt ye, but how long have you upon this earth? You say, I'll get saved tomorrow. Can I say that as a statement that's full of pride, arrogance, and stupidity? Firstly, because you do not know that you'll have any desire to be saved tomorrow. Secondly, you do not know if you'll have the mental capacity to call on God tomorrow. And thirdly, you don't know if you'll even be in this earth. The only time you have to deal with the matter of whom you follow is now. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Now is the time, the accepted time, the day of salvation. The third lesson I want to bring from this passage, and the final lesson I want to bring from this passage, occurs from verse number 25, but we want to read the first few verses before that. Look at verse 22. Elijah said to the people, I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks. Let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces. Lay it on wood and put no fire under it. And I will dress the other bullock and lay it on wood and put no fire under it. And call you in the name of your gods and I will call in the name of the Lord. And the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And the people answered and said, it is well spoken. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, choose you one bullock for yourselves, dress it first for ye are many. And call in the name of your gods and put no fire under it. And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it, and called in the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leapt upon the altar which was made, and they came to noon, and Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god, either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awaked. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass when midday was past, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regardeth. And Elijah said unto all the people, come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. It is believed that Baal was considered by the people of that day to be the sky god, the lord of the sky, the lord of the weather, the sender of lightning. And therefore, it's interesting that in the challenge, it should have been within the capability of Baal was whom they claimed he was to set a sacrifice on fire. But my third lesson tonight is this, the utter foolishness of depending upon false religion. I think this is one of the saddest pictures of the sinner in scripture. Because here we have people who were sincere, but they were sincerely wrong. You will notice they were engaged in lots of activity, but there was no reality. There wasn't so much as a voice, there wasn't so much as a movement that acknowledged there was someone or something listening to them. They were doing what they thought was right. They were doing what they assumed was worthy of response. But there was no knowledge of Baal's presence. And is that not a picture of many in our land today? They're doing what they think is right. They're worshipping at the altar of religion. And they think, well, I go to church and I take communion and I give in to the work and I do all of these things, but there's no reality, no peace, no joy of sins forgiven. Others are trying their best to be good, but they know really within their heart that there's so much sin in the past that no matter how hard they try, they couldn't make up for it. You see, there's people today engaged in false religion with no reality. 
Then they wasted so much time and there was no one to answer. Not a word. No hope at all. And I thought about all the false religions of this world. And I thought about those who in their sin even attend church services. And they go through the motions of prayer and the motions of worship and they're not yet saved. And I think how many prayers do such people pray and there's not one answer, not a word. Because they've never cried out to the one true and living God. How many people tonight call out to some false God, some figment of their imagination? How many are bowing before a statue hoping for peace? And then look, they ended up hurt, they ended up wounded and in great pain, but there was no blessing. They tried to afflict themselves and it reminds me of Martin Luther before he was saved and he wanted peace with God and what did he do? He started to whip himself and beat himself until his back bled. He made his life so uncomfortable because he thought somehow by uh, injuring himself and causing pain to himself then God surely would look down upon him and give him peace and that's what the people here were doing. But can I say this is the end of a life without Christ. You end up wounded. You end up scarred by sin and in great pain and suffering eternally in hell. Please listen tonight. Whoever you are, wherever you're listening from, there is only one true religion in this world. There is only one who is able to save your soul, who is able to give you peace with God, and that he demands that you confess your sin. He demands that you repent of your sin and he demands that you call upon him to save you from your sin. There's no other way to peace with God. There is no other way to forgiveness of sins. There's no other way to heaven apart from the finished work of Christ. And you can stand with the Baal worshippers and mutilate your body until you take your last breath, but it won't get you one step closer to heaven. God calls you to turn away from trying, from religion, from your works and from your efforts that are stained by sin, and to trust alone in the blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary. Oh, preacher, that's too narrow. That's too exclusive. That's too offensive to other people who don't agree. No, that's biblical. That's God's way. God has created you. God has created me. God has given his revelation. It's God's salvation. I don't come at it my way and hope for the best. I open this book and see what God says to me to repent and be converted. That's the only way. Anything else, anyone else that you depend upon will take you to hell. And after six hours of watching these foolish people embarrass themselves, harm themselves, hurt themselves, Elijah called the people to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. There had been an altar. There had been worship on the top of Mount Carmel previous to this. But now it was broken down. We need to be careful, very careful that we do not neglect the place of worship. We do not neglect the preaching of the word of God. That we do not neglect meeting with God. But we keep that altar established in our lives. And not only did he reinstate the altar, he prayed unto the Lord. Verse 36. Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord, and that thou hast turned their hearts back again. We're coming to a mission. We're going into a village in a land that largely has turned its back on God. What do we need to do? 
We need to pray, Lord, let it be known that thou art God. Move in these days. And friend, the Lord proved the reality of himself by fire. And the fire consumed the whole sacrifice. The fire consumed the altar. And the people declared, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. That's not the end. Because you see, the people who deny God and the people who try to lead the rest of the nation away in false religion, the punishment fell upon them. The punishment fell. You see, someday every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. No one will need to be convinced because he will appear in splendor and glory. Ah, but those who have died in their sin, those who are in their sin whenever time comes to an end, the punishment and the judgment of God will fall upon them. And that's why it's important that you, dear man, woman, boy or girl, know for sure tonight that you're saved. And should this be your last night upon this earth, whether by death or by the coming again of the Lord Jesus Christ, you know for you it is well with your soul. How long halt you between two opinions? If he is God, and let me tell you he is, then follow him. You're not called to follow a preacher. You're not called to follow a church. You're called to follow him. May God give you grace tonight to follow him. We close with the words of 233. Once again, the gospel message from the Savior you have heard. Will you heed the invitation? Will you turn and seek the Lord? Verses 1 and 2. And then verse number five, come believing, come to Jesus, look and live. Stand and sing. and remain standing for this final moment I challenge you have you wasted many summers 
Have you been through many harvests? Winter turning to spring. And yet tonight you're still in your sin. You've heard the gospel, you know the truth. And I say with the words of Elijah from all those years ago, how long halt ye between two opinions? Friend, don't be foolish. Don't play about with your soul. Decide for Christ tonight. Call upon his name that you might be saved. And the wonderful promise is that whosoever shall call shall indeed be saved. If I can be of help to you spiritually, I'll be in the hallway after the meeting. Please let me know. There's a little booklet in the stand out there called New Beginnings. If you want no more information about salvation, take that and read it through. But before you leave this building, call on Christ tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for the bringing to the point of decision. Uh, we realize that this has been done in Scripture over and over again. And Lord, every time the sinner hears the gospel, they make a decision. Oh Lord, don't allow them to halt between two opinions. Don't allow them, Lord, to take the world over Christ. Don't allow them to follow some false religion over Christ. Don't allow them to think that they know better than Christ. We pray, Lord, tonight you'll give the gifts of faith and repentance. The sinners will call and know the joy of sins forgiven. Lord, save tonight. We believe thou art able. And we leave the results of this meeting in thy hands. For thy glory, we pray these things. In Jesus' name, amen.